Welcome back to another North Carolina Tar Heels basketball podcast here on TarHeelIllustrated.com. I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones. Joining me is the esteemed, the esteemed basketball analyst and recruiting director, longtime college AAU high school coach. And now he's getting close to being longtime THI great. Mr. David Sisk. David, I'm going to pick your brain today about the Tar Heels. Long time, you and I, long, uh, long time THI staff member. We'll leave it. We'll there leave you it go. Legend. The legend. Um, uh, we haven't talked Tar Heels in a while. A lot of people have yeah. asked me for another uh, podcast with you, but our schedules have been what they are. It's been kind of hard to align things. So we have time now. So we're going to dive into the Tar Heels. This is the perfect time. It's an open date. Carolina is coming off a win Saturday over Virginia Tech, 96 to 81. Next game is in Charlottesville against UVA. Jacob and I will dive more into that later in the week. We're not going to talk about that game. We're going to talk about what we've seen so far, uh, specifically the the 10 game win streak and then the last six games, which have been different, and what we kind of how we view the team moving forward, what what needs to happen. So, David, I'm going to throw right at you right now. When you look at this team right now, and you told me this yesterday. Well, I'll, I'll let you say it here. Uh, how, how has your impression of Carolina changed in the last three weeks from when the, the winning streak ended at Georgia Tech to the three and three that they've been in the last six games? Well, you got to remember, this is opinion. And, you know, not everybody will agree with it because I like the defensive team that North Carolina had better than the team that's outscoring people. And I, I just loved – I'll go back to the Oklahoma game. I mean, I'm going to go back two months. And I'm going to go back to when they beat Oklahoma and Charlotte, the, the jump in, in, you know, uh, game. Um, this was a team up till then that was outscoring opponents. They weren't physical. And you remember, after the Kentucky game, Hubert Davis was despondent, basically, after the game and called him out. And so they weren't playing tough. They weren't playing fiscal. They got out tough. They got out work. Kentucky was the tougher team. And trust me, Kentucky is not a physical basketball team. <laughs> and so that was – he was really down about it. They had to week off just like they do now. Uh, I don't even think it was – my either it was for holidays or finals. It was one of those two. Christmas, yeah. Yeah. So they came back. In the Oklahoma game, I'm like, whoa, I, I don't recognize this team. And Oklahoma's physical. I'm like, I don't recognize this team, man. They're 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 making all the getting all the loose balls, they're defending. Somebody comes cuts down a lane or getting hip checked. Um, you know, they're rebounding, they're defending. Harrison Ingram really just asserted his will in that game, and all of a sudden it became a physical and they do it again and again and again. And I thought, we're on to something now. And like we said, 10 games in a row, they do not give up 70 points. So then they played Duke. And obviously the Duke game was a, a big win, you know, and, and beating Duke uh, is much greater than anything else that you can put into that equation. But North Carolina Duke, when they play, it always, and you can correct me because you've been to 2000 of them. They, it seems like, everybody's amped up offense and the pace of that game is always just frenetic. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember the last North Carolina Duke game where you just walk it down, run your set defense plays inside, not TV. Nobody runs. I mean, everybody is just so it's just up and down. And I think the coaches are willing to let them play that way because of yeah. all the energy. What's the state. So I'm like, okay, I don't like the fact that Duke scored as many points as they scored, but I understand the situation. But then it happens again. And again, and some of these turn out to be losses. Or now, not only are they giving up 70s, they're giving up in the 80s. Yeah. And so I began to wonder, have they gotten back to where they're scoring points and they've had some success, and all of a sudden they're just going to try to outscore other teams? Because that's what they were doing going into Oklahoma after they lost to Kentucky, after they lost to Villanova, after they lost to UConn, they're just giving up a lot of points. And, they're, and you know, you're just trying to outscore. So I would rather be the North Carolina team that wins 72-65 
than the North Carolina team that wins 85 to 78. And that may sound crazy to some people. Well, seven point wins a seven point win. But I think this team, they're talented, but this is not a roster that's just NBA laden. You're not going to have a bunch of lottery picks in this roster up and down. So the toughness, the team play on both ends, yeah. that's one thing that separated them because if you just get out and talented players getting up and down a court, making NBA type of plays, there may be certain teams they don't match up well with that. I think we've kind of already seen it with UConn. So yeah. uh, I, I just think the toughness end of it, I want to see them get that back. And even in the wins, they're three and three to last six. Even in a wins, I've not seen that. I've seen offense score, but I've not seen that from a defensive end. I want to see that back from this North Carolina team defensively because I'm going to be honest. I'm supposed to be impartial and all this, but I really enjoyed watching them play. And I like Hubert Davis as a coach, and I like this team. Love the way they play. There's a couple of teams. I like the way UConn plays. Yeah. I love the way North Carolina played at that time. I like the way Houston plays if they're good, especially defensively, if their offense picks up. But man, I just never I, I just loved it when they were going on both sides of the ball. I would see them get that back. You know, they loved it too. And that's the thing. I remember talking to Harrison Ingram in the locker room after Boston College, and that was a game Caroline did not play well offensively and just didn't really click, but they had every 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 the, the lunch pails and the tool shed and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. They brought all that stuff to the court. And that's how they won a game up there against a much improved BC team. And, and Harris had talked about how they love it. They, he said, we love to, to win yeah. a game when we don't play well, when it's not pretty, we love being that team. That's who North Carolina is now. And that's not what North Carolina has been the last couple of weeks. So I go on and do the three things after the game. And like a moron, I say, you know what? This is going to travel with this team the rest of the way. This has become who they are. But it stopped. It stopped during the Georgia Tech game. And it carried over to Well, Duke. it was for a very long stretch, Andrew. It was for a very long stretch. And I agree with you 100%. I was, too, because it wasn't, okay, two or three games or one game. And this went it on was 10. For five weeks. It was a 10-game so, yeah, win streak. it was. So I do think that they can get that back. I really do. I agree. And, and, I, and I, there are some things to point to as to why it's dropped a little bit, and we're going to get into that here. And I've got stuff on the site. Uh, the numbers are unbelievable. I've crunched all the numbers from a 10-game win streak and then compared them to the last six games. And, and a lot of it is what you would expect. And we'll get into some of those here in a minute. The rest are going to be in the article. We're not going to talk about everything here. It'll be a six-hour podcast. Um I'm going to go to go to Georgia Tech. I mean, watching that game, it was it was easy to say that's a one off. You got Duke coming up. People caught it a trap game. I didn't think it was. I just didn't think they played well, and they knew it wasn't a trap game because if it was a trap game, they wouldn't have had that team meeting when they got back to Chapel Hill. They had that because they knew there was something a little bit off and missing. That intensity wasn't there. And Harrison, again, said standing outside the locker room after that game in Atlanta, this won't happen again. But it has. I think there was a hangover against Clemson from the Duke game because let's face it, there's a lot of guys in this team that haven't tasted a lot of success. RJ and Armando had that run. That's it. They've never been this team in the regular season in their Carolina careers. Ingram wasn't involved in that at Stanford. Uh, Ryan didn't have it at Notre Dame. Uh, Withers didn't have it at Louisville. So for a lot of these guys, that was a high achieving moment. And, and it affected them with a really good Clemson team that came in and started 15 and two on them in that game. And the Car Hills struggled playing catch up. Then they go down to Miami. Then they go to Syracuse and they have Virginia Tech at home. I think the team's been tired. And I sensed that they were a little bit tired in Atlanta, but I really sensed it against Clemson. And then down in Miami, they got off to a nice start. And then Miami went 29 to 13 run on them to close out the half. Carolina, looked, that was the worst they looked all season. And they were tired. It was clear they were tired. Up at Syracuse, Armando admitted they were tired. It's a travel. They went through a period, David, of six home games in 75 days. That's that's a game every 12 and a half days. So I think part of it is this team has gotten tired. There's a bit, a little bit of weariness that is that it, that has uh, become part of the issue. And where does that show up? You're a coach. If you have a tired guy on the floor, you're going to see it on defense more than you're going to see it on offense. And I thought against Virginia Tech, this was a group that you get the ball, whatever juice you got in there, you're going to use it. 
On the other end, they didn't have it. And their rotations were terrible against Virginia Tech. They weren't very good against Syracuse. They've allowed a lot more drives to the basket of late than they had before. And also, Hubert has tinkered with things a lot because some things had dropped off. He even went back to switching too much, which I think is something he needs to stay away from, David. So I think the team's been tired. I think that's part of it. I think that the season and the grind of the season being what it is, remember UConn lost five out of six at one stretch last year, and then they ended up by far the best team in college basketball. I think that's a part of it too. What do you think? Yeah, uh, a couple things, and I want to hit your last note there. Going in to the weekend, in Ken Palm's top 20, there were only three teams in the country who had under five losses. Purdue, who happened to lose, Ohio State, Sunday, uh, Houston, and uh, UConn. Everybody else in his top 20 had five losses or more. So you're kind of in a deal this year where you remember a couple of years ago during the COVID year, you, you just wonder if anybody could get Gonzaga. You know, Baylor was really good too. And uh, you know, I felt like UConn going in last year. Of course, last year was kind of open too. I think this is another year just with the transfer portal and, and all of that. I, I think I think it's wide open. So, you know, with North Carolina – People might panic a little bit. And that's one reason we're not as panicky about it is because everybody else is in that situation too. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at Purdue, do you really trust Purdue in a tournament? I love the way Houston Look played. what happened Sunday. You know, they've, they've had the one good year. Yeah, I think UConn, all those three, has had the best, you know, I think the best track record. Uh, and they're the best team. I think every, yeah, I think everybody's in that group. So, I, I mean, there's not a whole lot of teams that I would really trade for where North Carolina is at. Now, I want to get to the schedule for a minute because I was thinking about this last night when we were texting. And, you know, I cover teams, the ACC and the SEC both. So, I see schedules, and I really think the ACC schedule, I don't think the ACC is the toughest league, but – it shouldn't be because they're playing a 20 game schedule and nobody else does that. So when I look at a 20 game schedule and let's say they open up with Pitt and then they play Clemson and they play some of these teams early, uh, you know, in a uh, Boston college, whoever, uh, and I'm speaking for any ACC team. And then you look at a team in another league. Well, they're playing high point and they're playing Miami of Ohio. And they're playing Georgia State. And they get those games slipped in because North Carolina, I would, I would put money on this, probably plays less low majors and high majors than any team in the country. Excuse me, low majors and mid-majors, I'm sorry, than anybody in the country. So, man, when other teams are get, getting those – you know, I think you watch a lot of teams, uh, they'll play a really good team at the first, see where they're at, and then they have boot camp for a couple of weeks. And they'll play eight, nine, ten games against low and mid-majors, and then about the middle of December, they come back around again to play a really good team to see where they're at. North Carolina's not doing it. So before they can get into the ACC, they're playing UConn, they're playing uh, Kentucky, they're going to the Bahamas, they play Tennessee at home. You know, Villanova, Arkansas, uh, Northern Iowa is a good team. Uh, so they're getting all these teams before they ever get into the ACC, man. That can get to be a gauntlet. So they're, and, and you take that physical style of play, um, take the 49ers, for example. The 49ers seems, and, and North Carolina doesn't have injuries, and that's a good thing, but I think yeah, they do be very more fortunate. I think the physical style of play, because if you look at the 49ers, every football game they played, they were so physical. Running the football, really good defensively. Guys got hurt. Guys got nicked up. Guys got banged up. Guys got worn down where the passing teams may not have done that as much. I think that's kind of everything there. You talk about the road trips. I'm talking about a schedule year long. And now, as you said, you've had all these road games, all this travel. We do know how many miles it is in Myrtle Beach from Miami to 
New York City, as we said, and they go up tweet. even farther into Boston. Yeah. So that was a great tweet. I, so, and I was thinking because that's what you said, and I was yeah. saying, "Hey, I've got that picture." But um, yeah, I agree with all that. So now you get a week to really kind of, and like I said, you see other teams do this too, where they're able to to recharge and then come back out. But I want to see it on the defensive end. I want to see the guards. You mentioned this attack up front. And I can see this in the last few games. They're playing contained. They're players yeah. just trying to get in the way. And they're not yeah. out there attacking the ball. And they're not – because that takes a lot of energy to be able to do that. And then I want to see – and then they've been rebounding. They've been getting to the foul line. But, you know, are you bumping – do you just have all that energy just to make what we always call that extra defensive play and the pressure of the ball and getting the pass the lanes? Yeah. That's what I want to see when they come back out off his hiatus. Couple of things since they went to the Bahamas, which was before Thanksgiving, they've only played one of those low majors, and that was Charleston Southern, uh, yeah. uh, December 29th. Uh, the rest of it has been in Northern Iowa, which is a pretty good program, yeah. a decent uh, Missouri Valley team. Since uh, after playing Northern Iowa, it's been power conference teams, yeah. nothing but power conference teams except Charleston yeah. Southern, and 12 of the 18 were away from home. So uh, that's that's a pretty significant – or 12 of the 18 since uh, they went to play Con uh, Connecticut in Madison Square Garden. So, really, it's – I'm brain, racking my brain here – 15 out of 22 games since before Thanksgiving were away from home or away from Chapel let, Hill. Let me say this, too. So, it's not like they're going on the road and they're just laying around in a hotel and then they go play a game. Man, you got everything that goes to being a college athlete, a student athlete. You know, they got tests, they got classes. Um, you know, they're doing homework. Uh, yeah, I'm sure they still got weight room. They got study halls. They got all you've got to get up in the morning. And and yeah. I, I tell kids this all the time. Well, I want to play college sports, and I know that they don't understand what goes with it. And I said, Well, are you good with a college coach? telling you what to do every second of your life for four years from six in the morning to midnight because yeah. everything's on a the schedule. There's no, this is not fast times at Ridgemont High. You know, you've <laughs> got, you've got that schedule. So I'm telling you, even away from the court, it's exhausting because it never lets up and yeah. it's just you're tired. You know, North Carolina is a tough school and, you know, hopefully, Student athletes everywhere have to deal with that. Yeah. Which you know they do at North Carolina. So when you've got all these tough games and you've got all this travel, there, there's like you say, this may be even and they've got classes now, but maybe they can go back and just, you know, getting in bed at a decent hour, get up at a decent hour, and, and you know, you get two or three good nights sleep in your own bed, and you know, hopefully that'll change things around. Yeah, I could shed some quick light on that real fast. What their routine is is that they practice, they practice it three o'clock in the afternoon, they finish practice, they shower and they get their meal and then they fly to wherever they're playing the next day. So it's, they're not flying. They're not flying at 11 AM. They're usually taken off about six o'clock in the evening, five thirty, six o'clock in the evening. And they go to their next destination. So if you go back and look at the, the the Miami Syracuse trip, which I did all in one trip, I flew to Miami on a Friday flew from Miami to Syracuse on a Monday and then flew home on a Wednesday. What they did, they flew to Miami Friday evening. And then as soon as the game ended, you know, we're talking to the kids and they're getting the bus, bus takes them right to the airport. They fly back to Chapel Hill. And then on Monday, yeah. they turn around, they go up to Syracuse. And I often know this because when Steve Kirshner will send, cer certainly used to, when he'd send stuff to us, like certain notes or something like that, I would know that they had already landed and they were arriving in Chapel Hill. And often I'm still in the arena, but it's two o'clock in the morning, one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. And those kids have class the next day. It is a difficult regiment and it is a regiment. And, and it, that can be part of the wear and tear as well. And I'll tell you something too, when they get back, I guarantee you there's breakfast checks. So, and there's probably eight o'clock classes. Uh, because yeah, because they I've have to have everything known. in so they can practice at three and yeah, take yeah, off. Yeah, that's the thing. You've got afternoon practice, so you can't be one of those deals. Well, I'm not going to have a class till 11 o'clock, and that way yeah. I can go up in the afternoon and I can sleep in. Like I know, you because say, you just – that's 
you've got to get everything done in the morning. So I don't care what time you get in, you've got breakfast check. And you, because these are athletes, it's not like, well, I'll get up and go straight to class. Man, you've got to eat, you've got to no. fuel up. So they've got breakfast before then, then they've got eight o'clock classes. So the, a lot of times they're going on very, very little sleep. Yeah. The, um, the Friday pressers we have with Hubert at the Smith Center in the press room, the press room's right across from where the players train and get taped and all that kind of junk. And it's right adjacent to the locker room. And I get there about 1 15, 1 o'clock, 1 15 for a two o'clock press conferences, and the guys are already there. They're getting taped up. They're getting looked at. They're doing some stretching and all that kind of stuff. And so they probably, for a three o'clock practice, they're probably there at one. So that window, that window shuts pretty quickly. It's a small window for these kids. So they have to jam all that stuff in there. Uh, it, it is not an, an easy schedule. This week, however, is an opportunity for them to fix some of the things that need fixing. I asked Hubert Monday in the ACC conference call, what's at the top of the list? And he went right to defense, which which is right. It is the area that needs the most work right now. And David, a couple of numbers I'll throw out, and this speaks a little bit to what you were talking about a few minutes ago, but uh, stopping the ball, that's the beginning of how, where you are defensively. It's the most important part of your defense because that's on the ball for sure. But they have not done a very good job of that of late. In the 10-game win streak, Opponents were shooting, opponents shot 43% on layups. So that's challenge drives, that's challenge stuff at the rim, that's players rotating over and challenging and affecting shots. In the last six games, opponents are shooting 64% on layups. That's a 21% difference. So where, where how does that show up? During the 10-game win streak, opponents were averaging 7.1 made layups a game. Now, in the last six games, they're averaging 12.4 made layups a game, and their transition points haven't increased. They're averaging the same number of transition points. So that means they're scoring more layups in the half court against Carolina's quote-unquote set defense. That's a tired defense to me, David. Two other quick numbers. Teams are shooting 9% higher from the field, 36% to 45%, 36 percent 36 half to 45 and a half. And nine points higher from three-point range, up from 24.9% to 33.8%. That's a result of the driving lanes being there. They're getting more kickouts. They're getting. They're allowing more uncontested shots. All that stuff's not working. That's that's the head of the snake. They've got to get back to what they were during the 10-game streak. If they do that, this is a different team, and this is one that could get to Phoenix. Yeah, um, and I, I don't really feel like you know, when the defense was cranked in, you know, we, we think of Harrison Ingram, Harrison Ingram and Carmack Ryan. Those two guys really step out because they're just all over the place. You know, Ingram's such a physical presence, and Carmack Ryan's just throwing his body around. I mean, he's like a, a, a walking demolition derby out there. You know, he's getting – causing loose balls. And we're just, just running into people and flying around. And, you know, bait caught, gives you that muscle inside. I don't really feel like we realize how good they are out front defensively. Um, I think Seth Trimble, you know, obviously, and I think it's kind of he's kind of a defensive first player, so he kind of gets that. Uh, he's got to have that attitude, and people kind of embrace that. But man, I watch Elliot Cano, man, he is so good, and so tenacious on the ball, and uh, really gets into guys. Feet's always moving. Sometimes he's a little too quick for his own good, and he'll overrun some things. But man, he's just really tough out there, and, and, and RJ. You know, it's going to fight. They're not the biggest guys, but they fight you. Really, the only way that you're going to beat them is, is, is to use your size. And I do think Syracuse got that. Now, I'll, I'll use that point. You know, you, you look at the two guards that they had that were really good, and they're, uh, you know, uh, Judah Mintz and J.J. Starling. You're talking about two six four guards, whereas, you know, they're a little bit smaller. North Carolina six foot six one, and – they hit a lot of tough mid-range jumpers that game. And it wasn't on ball screens. It wasn't on things like that. They just went one-on-one, -on -one, got into the lane, and shot over them. And I do think North, they shot really well that game, but North Carolina made, made them make some shots. But it wasn't a deal where they switched and all that or getting mismatched. It was bigger guards going and, and, and just going up over them in, in the lane. But I said that to bring this up, you know, when they played in North Carolina, they really got in them, and they didn't let them have that penetration. They never let them turn the corner. And that's one thing I've seen. There have been two games here that, that we've had where you've had rematches. 
And, and Clemson didn't shoot the ball well at all. Clemson, they couldn't make anything. And they yeah. couldn't miss it. It seemed like in Chapel Hill. And same way with Syracuse. So you're seeing two teams that struggle the first time were around compared to really having their way offensively the second time they played, both both games. So we'll see. Is there a scouting report out on North Carolina we don't know about? You know, is there a blueprint against them? We'll kind of see as they go in and play some of these teams the second time. It's going to be interesting. But I do think I do think there was some the, the Clemson game, there was some hangover. Uh I mean, I really do. And then uh the Syracuse game, I, I think you probably saw some fatigue and, and Syracuse played really, really well. So yeah. we'll see which one it is. Like I said, I've got faith in this team because we've seen what they can do over a long, long stretch, over a five week stretch. So I, I think they're going to rebound and, and they're still one of the few teams in the country in Ken Palm's top twenty in both offensive and defensive efficiency ratings. Yeah. So I, I I think they can get it back where they're balanced on both sides. Yeah, I think in the case of Clemson and Syracuse, Clemson knew that human nature suggested there would be a hangover. So they were the aggressor out of the gate. Yeah. They attacked. They got a lot of open threes out of attacking, and they built that big early lead. I think Syracuse knew there was some fatigue because they had seen the way Carolina struggled closing out Miami, which they've struggled late in games lately, which during the 10-game stretch, they were outstanding late in games on both ends of the floor. That's another sign of fatigue. I think Syracuse knew that. And they had the the fact that they had lost by 36 to Chapel Hill. There was plenty of juice for Syracuse going into that game. And they also attacked and were the aggressor. And I think they kind of knocked Carolina back on its heels a little bit, no pun intended, in both those games. And they recovered, but they didn't have a lot of juice, enough juice to finish it off. In fact, if you go to Clemson, it was 70 to 70 with just under four minutes left. Carolina turned over the ball the next three possessions and then on Clemson's possessions following those turnovers, Carolina allowed offensive rebounds that turned into points. And then you go to Syracuse, Carolina had the ball down four with two minutes left, and that began a, six, a series of four turnovers, I think, in five possessions for the Tar Heels, and they weren't able to close the deal in that game either. So I, I think fatigue is absolutely it. The players said it themselves Saturday after Virginia Tech, or uh, even though Hubert wouldn't say it, the players said it, and I'll go with what the players said on this one. This week is going to be very, very valuable for them to get those legs back. And I go back and think about NC State. I watched them when I got home Saturday night. I taped the NC State Clemson game, and State had a week off, and they went to Clemson, and that was a really, really big game for NC State. And they were the aggressor all night. They were very athletic. They were as bouncy as I've seen them all year long. And Mike Jeminski kept talking about, hey, look, they had a week off. They used the week to recharge. Yeah. And sometimes recharging is more important than tweaking anything that you do uh, schematically. You just got to get recharged the right way, not just your bodies, but your brains. And that's why it was interesting when I asked Hubert after the game Saturday what the schedule was for this week. Saturday was off. They did a special or Sunday was off. They did a special Olympics thing. Monday, they were going to do sort of a, a, a hard shoot shoot around with a little bit of running. Tuesday is a practice about improving get up on them. It's a, it's a self-practice. Wednesday is a lot of film and a light work. And then Thursday, they get back to normal routine, getting ready for Virginia. I think that's a good schedule. That's a lot of time to get let the brain rest. And if the brain is, is rested, the body's going to be more rested too. Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of times this year, uh, at this time of year, uh, you don't see three-hour practices. Um, yeah. you know, it's, it's an hour. I don't think anybody right now practices over an hour and a half. So, and even the hardcore coaches, they realize as you get late in the season, uh, you know, they want legs as fresh as they can get them. Uh, it, it's interesting to me how they kind of switch up, you know, one day hard, one day off, one day hard. Uh, so that's interesting too. So they're varying that, but they've been through this with a week off and they know, and, and, you know, this was planned out well before this week. They knew exactly what they wanted to do with it. Absolutely. Before we go, I want to want to talk about Cormac Ryan. Uh, just spent a couple of minutes on him. He's – it's amazing how Carolina fans react to his shooting. He does so many things on the floor to help you win games. A lot of them don't end up in the stat sheet because Hubert will say – 
And I have asked Hubert, I asked him just last Friday about Cormac, about specifically the shooting. And Hubert just goes in another direction. Well, Cormac does all these other things for us, talk about rebounding and stuff like that. And like, he didn't have any rebounds in the last game. But he does do a lot of floor things. I think there's a lot of energy. There are a lot of things guys can can feed off of him. But absolutely, David, without doubt, he needs to knock down threes. Yeah. He has to be a guy that hits threes for them. And what we've seen, what we saw last week, he was eight for 16 from three last week. He was two for five against Miami. So in the last three games, he's 10 for 21. And remember, it's not that long ago when teams were face guarding RJ all over the floor. They backed off that now. And RJ when it had a 20 point game on 13 shots against Virginia Tech, as opposed to 20 point game on 20 shots, which had been the norm there for a while. Teams had to back off the face guarding, and the guy that's guarding Cormac has to be out on him more and respect him more. It's a longer distance to drop down on double Armando. And what's Armando done? Armando went for 25 against Virginia Tech. So the effect of Cormac Ryan, if he can be be a 38, 40% guy from three the rest of the way, what does that do for this team? Well, it's huge. And look, I, I, I can't remember – which game it was, but uh, there was one when he and Harrison, and I put Harrison Ingram in the same boat. Uh, to, and I said that, you know, North Carolina has to have them. They have to make, has to have those two guys making threes. Yeah. And there wasn't much, but there was some blowback making it sound like, you know, I was blaming them for the loss. I wasn't doing that. What I was saying is if they make threes, they're such a different team yeah. because yeah. you I mean how do you guard them if you've got RJ Davis going for 25 you've got Baycott doing his thing inside and now you've got these two guys making outside shots because you can't pack it in you can't like you said you can't gear your defense and face guard toward RJ because they're going to get some looks um, and, and every defense uh, you know, you, you give something, you take something away. So when yeah. you're trying, and I've said this, I think a lot of teams have taken so much away from Baycott, especially on screen and rolls and things like that. I think yeah. they've let RJ play in some in some space off the ball screen. I really do. And I think it's freed him up. And I think Baycott takes some criticism that he shouldn't have to take at times because I think his mere presence gets other guys shots. One of those guys is Cormac Ryan. So here's the thing. When people look at Cormac Ryan, they go, oh, okay, man, he went one for eight. <clears throat> three, excuse me. But here's the problem. Are, those shots are open shots. So that's what makes it look bad because they're open threes. They're not where he they're not Michael Jordan on Byron Russell getting into that paint, trying to go over. They're not. They're open because that's in the flow of the offense and the defense is taking something else away. So uh, he's streaky. We've said this all along. He's going to be streaky. There's going to be good games. There's going to be bad games. But uh, when he is one for eight, one for nine from three, and Harrison's struggling as well, it, may, it, it, it can give the other team hope. But I'm telling you, when they're on and they're defending, they, they're they one of the hardest outs in college basketball. So yeah, Harrison, Harrison yeah. has found some consistency from the perimeter the last couple of months, and that's why I didn't even mention him. Formac, to me, gives him that third guy out there, and it changes it. And by the way, you're right, totally right about Armando. That's why you notice Armando's numbers started picking back up when teams were, were face-guarding RJ, and Duke was the first team to do that. And it changed how teams were guarding him because they saw RJ just go crazy against Georgia Tech. You got to you got to stop that because he could go thirty. He can go thirty five. He went thirty six against Wake. He can do that. And now you throw in Cormac. I firmly believe if they can get somewhere close, maybe to be ninety percent of what they were defensively during the ten game win streak. And you add, and they're and they're who they are, adding a consistent Ryan on the perimeter. And Hubert uses the bench some, which we're not going to get into that now. We'll talk. We'll see how that goes in the next couple of weeks. But if if Ryan is hitting at a thirty eight percent or so clip as well, that's a team that can get the Phoenix. That's a team that has the parts absolutely to get the Phoenix. The last six games, they haven't looked like a Phoenix team. But these components working together, that's a Phoenix team, David. Yeah. So, you know, you've got 
roughly two and a half. There's going to be two weeks left in the season when you get back on the fourth Saturday. Yeah. Then you get into the ACC tournament. And, and the whole dynamic's kind of strange because how many teams have you seen that have played really, really well? Wonder League Tournament, and then they, they, they spend so much in the league tournament, then they go out the first weekend. You know, and it, so it's – it's you, you you never know when you're going to be up, when you're going to be down. It's a balancing act. That's why I've always said that first – really the first two days of the NCAA tournament to me are, are exciting as anything in sports. And I, I've got a buddy, he'll take off work every year and go to a sports book in Las Vegas and just sit there and watch. And he said, there's nothing yeah. like it. Just watch. And so uh, North Carolina, you don't, or the thing is you got to be playing your best going in, you know, and there may be some glitches and you understand that because Hubert Davis understands that because you've got to play the game. Let's say in these last four games, they go three and one. Let's say, they win one, lose one ACC tournament. They're going four and two, and some people may think it's the end of the world. Well, it's <laughs> not. You've just got to be playing solid. You may have games where you don't make shots. The defense has got to be good. Uh, they've just got to be playing, you know, really where the coach wants them and are most solid, you know, going down the stretch because it's about that time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to get back on and do one of these here in the next couple of weeks or so. We – we should have done more, but our schedules have been wild and it's been difficult to line some of these up. So we'll definitely hop on here in the next week or two. Tar Heels have five regular season games left. Virginia on the road. And the last four are in the state of North Carolina. They've got Miami, NC State, Notre Dame at home, and then at Duke before they go to the ACC tournament in Washington, D.C. This is good for sport. This is good, by the way, for sports yeah, writers because sports writers don't have to travel that far we're 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 cool with the way the schedule is right now for a couple and, of weeks but go ahead andrew I'm, I'm i'm very uh intrigued to watch virginia uh that that's the first game back because you know the root canal you're gonna have to go through charlotte's and you know yeah. the physical style and i've used that word a bunch i like to have a dollar every time i've said fiscal on the show but they're going to have to be very very fiscal there that's what I want to see. I don't think they have any problem. Oh, we were talking about under the whole, uh, sure, goodness, you can hold Virginia under 70. But, you know, can you, how do you do offensively? How do you rebound? How do you get to 50-50 balls? How do you make the extra plays? That's going to show the things that we want to see this team do. You're going to have to do it to get a road win at Virginia. And the interesting thing to me is this may be the team that's most equipped to do that than any North Carolina team in the past several years. You know, we've had some seem go in there and you just like, man, they are not up to what they're going to have. They're just not together. They're not willing to pay that price. This team to me, of any that they've had is cut out yeah. to go in there against the Cavaliers and play that style of ball, come out and win. Yeah, I agree. I think this is the perfect opponent on the road there where North Carolina has not won in 12 years. Tyler yeah. Zeller, Kendall Marshall, Harrison Barnes, they won there in 2012. Carolina hasn't won there since. So I agree with you. I think, and I think Hubert kind of sits back and smiles and says, you know what? That's what we need to jump back into. We need yeah. to go in there, have the mindset and the physicality to win that game and then keep that. That'll be the blueprint for the rest of the way if they're able to get it done. I do agree. I think this team is built better, more equipped to go up there and get a win in Charlottesville and, and, and some of the more recent ones. You know, if you go in there and win that type of game, how does that propel them? Not only yeah. the momentum, but to play that way, well, yeah. that kind of toughness going forward. When they look at it, Hubert Davis comes in and says, see, that's what I've been telling you. This is the way we got to play, and you guys can yeah. do that. Yeah, I think it's huge. I, I'm looking forward to it. Can't wait to get up to Charlottesville. Always enjoy JPJ. It's one of the finest places to cover a game anywhere that I cover games on a regular basis. David, Did you ever go up there when they had the old arena? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. U-Haul? Yeah. We played, that was called University Hall. We played. It was a uh, circle. It was a circle. Yeah, People had we played an AAU weird. tournament. We played an AAU tournament up there back in the late 90s. And I remember going in there, and it was in the spring. And, man, it was like they had these doors. It looked like you were going in like an abandoned 
mall or movie yeah. theater, old uh, you know movie theater. Yeah. I mean, it, it was it, you know, and, and to see these uh, how the, what these neo arenas look like compared to the old ones. I mean, the old you go to Ole Miss and they've still got the old one up right across the street from a new one. The old one looks like a housing project. I mean, compared to what they got now. Yeah. So it, it, it's yeah, amazing. U-Haul was a tough place was, to cover a game. They would sit the media floor level behind the, the, the behind the TV broadcast crew, and that was back in my early days. So I'm on the third row. So technically I'm on the fourth row from the floor. We're all the same level. And I'm I'm watching the game trying to cover, and I want everything to be played at the rim so I can actually see the action. It was terrible, so it's good well, now. I, I love JPJ; it's a great place. Well, there's still nothing like seeing you on TV, you know, in the front row at Cameron Indoor, and you've got some 18 year old hanging over the top of you. It's been drinking Boone's Farm all day. Yeah, you know, nothing, so nothing like nothing like Cameron crazy alcohol sweat getting all over <laughs> you. <laughs> We'll, we'll approach that here in a couple of weeks. Uh, just tell uh, my young staffers that might cover the game, do not wear white because you'll never get it out. It'll stay there forever. Wear a shirt you don't love. <laughs> I'm like jeans going to Mardi and, and Gras. an old polo shirt. I used to go to Mardi Gras before I got married, and, and, and I had uh, some guy ask me one time, he said, I'm going to go down there. What, what, got any advice what to do? And I said, the only advice I'm going to give is don't pair it. Well, don't wear a new pair of shoes. That'd be my <laughs> only advice. Yeah, no kidding. All right, man. Good stuff. He's David Sisk. I'm AJ. By the way, go over our site, guys. Just $8.33 a month. You can be a premium subscriber and have access to everything that's in that piece I was talking about. I'm, we only talked about a couple of the stats. I, did everything it's in there and you can only access it if you are a premium subscriber so you could be a Tar Heel insider and expert too he's david i'm aj thanks for stopping by